You know, I actually really enjoy the Miami Grand Prix. You've got the stunning location, cars never too far away from an accident, brilliant wheel-to-wheel -wheel action all race long, and the most affordable food pricing I've seen at any venue. Can you tell I'm being sarcastic yet? Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that glazes Daniel Ricciardo like a fangirl. Well, in fairness, Alex Forsyth Racing UK 6596, I have good reason to this weekend. Until Q1, that is. A lot has happened in the run-up to this one, and we have a ton of stuff to dive into. But I do want to kick things off with some channel news this week, and if you haven't been paying attention to my community posts for the second time this year, I've had one of my best performing videos taken down for supposed copyright. And this time, they revealed themselves as mega c and attempted to strike down the channel. I'm not going to reveal the party or individuals involved, besides saying it may not be who you think. Though if they are watching, I just want to let you know that I hope you get in a terrible accident which leaves you paralysed from the neck down and you spend the rest of your days dribbling like a sh** fountain. In all seriousness, I'm expecting the algorithm to now f*** me like one of the Epstein kids, so a like and share would mean even more this week. But with that out of the way, let's get into the comedy review. It's the Miami Grand Prix. Okay, so it's news time, and where better to start than with the big story of the week, Adrian Newey deciding that the Red Bull hissy fit wasn't for him, and thus promptly telling Christian Horner to go f*** himself, or his assistant again. Maybe he used slightly nicer words than that. The designer has been a cornerstone of the Red Bull outfit since its early years, and his absence after almost 20 years in the role will most certainly be felt throughout the team. It's of course refueled the rumours that Max is also jumping ship, but for the 5,675th time, that is not going to happen. You know, it better not now, you know. Anyway, it will come as no surprise to hear that Newey's next landing spot has been the speculation of the weekend, with the current favourite slated to be Ferrari, whilst Williams have been rumoured to be a shock underdog. No doubt they've made Logan Sargent give up his kidney in order to pay for that. Speaking of the American, his future was in the headlines as well. An anonymous team allegedly approaching the FIA to grant F2 driver Kimi Antonelli a super licence for Imola. I've already outlined why I think this is an astonishingly shit idea in its own video, so go and watch that if you want my actual thoughts on this. Stepping away from the rumours and into some actual concrete news, Nico Hülkenberg has announced that he'll be driving for Sauber in 2025. If I remember correctly, I think I likened that to having leukemia a few weeks ago, but hey, maybe Hulk has a fetish for that kind of thing. In all seriousness, if he can battle through the pain of next season, then perhaps there's an opportunity in 2026 when the outfit properly turns into the Audi squad. But I think it will still take a little longer than that before they can even think about challenging at the front. That said, I've been wrong many times before, so let's see. Oh, and if you're wondering which driver Hulk's replacing, Joe announced a new McDonald's advert 15 minutes later, so I think we have our answer. I promise we will get into the on-track action eventually, but a couple of teams have new liveries for this weekend, so to be inclusive to the idiots out there, let me remind you who is who. Ferrari came into this weekend with a new title sponsor in HP, and heavily teased a switch from red to blue for Miami. Keep social media going mad with mock-up liveries, showing just how good that car could look. And then they revealed whatever the f*** this is. I'm disappointed and yet not surprised by this one. At least RB would do a little bit better later in the week with an LGBTQIA whatever the others are inspired paint job, which also acts as a visual reminder to Lance Stroll to look where he's f***ing going. Let's finally get into practice then, which will be made up of just a single hour long session as we'll be getting yet another sprint this weekend, because more laps around Miami is what every F1 fan wants. With the limited running then, drivers didn't have long to get their eye in and had to make every minute count. Apart from Charles Leclerc, apparently, who was busy filling contractual obligations for HP and getting them a little bit more screen time. The Monogasque spun at the tight final sector, blocking the track and bringing out the red flag. Drivers were pushing the limits early on, even Max Verstappen going off at the final hairpin. McLaren was suffering from a different issue, however. Both drivers complained they had a stiffy. No, sorry, their steering was stiff. Yeah, that was it. Norris took out his frustration by bullying a poor Bullard in the pit lane as Verstappen went top with a 1 minute 28.595. The Dutchman has won every single race in the States since 2021, so I've got a feeling we're in for more pain this weekend. We'd find out soon enough as sprint qualifying got underway. Oscar Piastri will likely get the new McLaren update to the next round of the championship in Imola. 
yet he seemed to forget he still needs his current car as he attempted to close line Bottas into turn one. Besides that scare, it was a pretty decent SQ1 for McLaren, ending at first and second, while further back, Sargent finally had an epiphany. I'm such a dumb the American would actually end up beating his teammate for what from memory I think is the first time ever. It wasn't on pace of course, Albon just tried to take a shortcut through the chicane. McLaren's form would continue in SQ2 as Norris entered it on top once again. The same couldn't be said for the Mercedes cars though, who have rarely taken a liking to this Miami circuit in the past and would see both Russell and Hamilton in the drop zone as the chequered flag fell. So as Toto Wolff went to take a cyanide pill, the remaining drivers geared up for the top 10 shootout. With sprint quality rules, that meant everyone had to switch to the soft compound tyres, and the McLarens, who looked dead set for pole up to now, didn't really like them very much. They weren't the only ones, the Pirelli's about as predictable as a schizophrenic off his meds, and that allowed for a few surprises. Stroll beat out Alonso, Ricardo somehow willed his new chassis to P4, and Verstappen took pole, the Dutchman literally lolling the field as he pulled into Park Ferme. It's a P1 match. Lol. Leclerc would take second and would hope to catch the Red Bull ahead in the short run down to turn one. With the F1 TV crew even trying to spice up the results, we got Rennie for five red lights. Charles would get the better start, but Max managed to retain the lead. Further back, a Checoism allowed Ricky Bobby into third, while Hamilton toe punted Alonso into Stroll, who proceeded to also wipe out Norris. With the Briton and Canadian both out of the running, let's see what Verstappen thought of all that. Lord. The safety car came out as the stricken McLaren was removed from the Turn 1 apex, and when we went back to green, it wasn't long before Perez got his way back past Ricardo. At this stage, I believe the Honey Badger would just sink like a dead tramp in the Thames, but he was able to hold off the hard-charging sights behind, latching onto Checo's arse with DRS in the opening laps. Eventually, the Mexican threw Daniel to the wolves and went off to pursue Leclerc ahead. Given we never saw him again, you can guess how all that went. While Ricardo still tried to hold on in fourth, further back, his teammate was observing a battle with... Well, I think that music kind of gives it away. We've not had much need for Haas watch this year, but Kevin Magnussen will be bringing it back with a bang in the sprint. With the Danish driver holding on to the final point in 8th and teammate Hülkenberg ahead in 7th, the number 20 car would once again be used as the sacrificial lamb to secure the result for the team. K-Mag thus treated the second half of the race like a video game once you've turned all the rules off. He was cutting the chicane, running Hamilton behind into the walls, forgetting his breaking points Lance Stroll style all the while picking up more penalty points than he has championship points over the last 24 months. Don't get me wrong though, this was great fun to watch. If I was a Lewis Hamilton fan, I might be a bit more incensed, but who cares what they think anyway? Half of them have already turned their TVs off, and maybe that's for the better. As well, the seven-time champion escaped the blame for his kamikaze dive on lap one, the stewards would still find a way to penalise the Briton docking him 25 seconds for apparently speeding in the pit lane. Of all the people to come to Hamilton's defence, I'm willing to bet you wouldn't guess it would be Fernando Alonso. The Spaniard came out post-race to accuse the stewards of effectively being xenophobic, and when you consider Max Verstappen got a fine last year for the exact same offence, you can maybe begin to see his point. If you want my thoughts though, I don't think the stewards are racist, I just think they're really shit at their jobs. Anyway, I was covering a race here, wasn't I? Well, Verstappen would take the win, which won't come as a shock to anyone, while further back, Daniel Ricciardo somehow retained P4, which, yes, made me tinkle a little. The Aussie was quick to address all the haters, no, I don't know what you're on about, by claiming it was just nice to remind some people. Let's pray that doesn't age badly later on. The one downside of RB getting double points is they then put this on social media, and apologies in advance. The year rapey music aside, this is just the face of pure pain and what the f*** is Warwick Davis planning back there? Maybe it was giving Daniel his old chassis back as we headed back into Grand Prix qualifying. The Honey Badger driving around with no control of his rear end and failing to make it through Q1. Great guessy s*** again. Max Verstappen would also run into difficulties on his flying lap in the form of one of the Alpines. I think that was the Alpine flat out. <laughs> 
David Coulthard would be a great replacement for me on the comedy review. On the other end of the timing tower, Logan Sargent actually looked like he could get out of the drop zone. Then Sonoda started f***ing with him as well. Traffic also ruined Magnussen's lap, and in the confusion, the two Alpines somehow managed to get into the second session. And where exactly did that come from? The two job centre drivers would complete the drop zone as we moved on to Q2 and watched Alex Albon make one of the strangest mistakes I think I've seen in a while. I'm starting to think Logan's pace is like women's periods. After a while, they just start to sync up. The big shock of Q2 would be Alonso being outqualified by his teammate once again. A mistake-ridden lap, leaving the Spaniard down in 15th place. Hulkenberg and the Dwarf would manage to sneak into the top 10 shootout, which was once again dominated by a certain Max Verstappen. The tyres were back to behaving like insolent children again, though Mercedes did themselves no favours when they got to the final runs for pole and discovered they'd miscounted their sets of softs. That forced Hamilton and Russell back onto the mediums, which went down really well on Friday and again saw them end up 7th and 8th at the session's conclusion. Max would therefore be leading a pair of Ferraris into Turn 1 on Sunday. The Scuderia, revealing their secret plan to win, involved getting into a 1-2 situation, then staying there. Sounds simple enough, now let's watch them f*** it all up. Well, that didn't end up taking long, Leclerc getting off the line at snail's pace, while Perez revealed he'd woken up and chosen violence, almost taking inspiration from the Bottas handbook of race starts as he attempted to wipe out Verstappen and make the next 57 laps vaguely interesting for once. This was Sergio Perez, however, so he still managed to cock this all up. The Mexican's dive bomb was fantastic news for Oscar Piastri, who never gazed his way into third, which soon became second when he passed Leclerc down the back straight. With the Sappen switching on cruise control at the front, attention turned back to Hamilton's continuing nightmare with the Haas drivers. This time it was Nico Hülkenberg picking a fight with Team LH, initially losing out to the Briton, though took the place back, when Lewis hashtag blessed the final hairpin with some of his Pirelli rubber. Ferrari strategy time, and after 10 laps of checking, the Boffins attempted to bait McLaren into a stop by coming out into the pit lane after their drivers had already crossed the line. You know what, it's cute they tried, I guess. Up at the front, the Red Bull of Verstappen had been driving around error free up to this point, but the Dutchman was clearly bored and thus decided to bring a passenger along for the ride. When this bollard revealed itself to be a Lewis Hamilton fan, Max f***ed it off onto the racing line though, and while this would normally trigger a virtual safety car, the stewards had clearly nodded off and, quite frankly, I can't blame them. It was only until someone decapitated the bollard that the VSC was eventually called out. Max decided that he didn't need that advantage and only made his stop once the track was green again, putting Piastri into the lead for what will probably be a handful of laps before the Dutchman cruises by. Piastri would actually pit before that would happen, though would lose out to Leclerc who had boxed earlier. You're probably thinking this is bad, but it was about to get a whole lot worse, as just a lap later, Magnussen tried to race Logan Sargent like he had Lewis Hamilton the day before, only forgetting that Logan Sargent isn't Lewis Hamilton. The fast would only continue when the safety car picked up the wrong driver. In fairness to Bern Maylander, I would have assumed it was Max Verstappen too, but a little up the road, Lando Norris was actually the one in the lead, and looked as if he would gain an entire lap on the field before the stewards realised their mistake. Maybe that's just some form of handicap for the McLaren driver, but the field would eventually catch up, and now, for the first time potentially ever at a Miami Grand Prix, I was actually invested. No wins, looked like he'd already f***ed it up on the restart, but managed to hold the Dutchman off into Turn 1. In a couple of laps, he'd already checked out, 1.5 seconds ahead, it actually looked like he might have this in the bag. The other McLaren was in its own scrap with the Ferrari of Carlos Sainz, who found himself pushed off by Piastri and then all of his toys out of the pram. With the stewards spinning their wheel of penalties and deeming this okay, Carlos took matters into his own hands, running over his front wing like a Chinese protester and laughing in the mirrors as the Aussie fell to the rear of the field. Shall we take a break to check in on the penalty counter for K-Mac? And it appears to have broken, the Dane being penalised for his assassination of Sargent then again for not serving that correctly, then again for entering the pit lane when he wasn't allowed. The only man with more red mist in front of him right now might be Carlos Sainz, who was now the one under investigation for the clash with Piastri earlier. I'm willing to bet his engineer didn't make him aware of that one. Up at the front though, Lando No Wins was about to shed the nickname. The Briton crossed the line to take a sensational debut victory, finally eradicating Daniel Ricciardo's last bit of credibility of being the last McLaren driver to win a race. If you're wondering why I haven't mentioned his name recently, it's because he got passed by Lance Stroll and I pretty much gave up after that. You're probably wondering who my driver of the day is right now. Actually, you probably aren't, but today I'm going with Kevin Magnussen. 
The Dane ended up being the saviour of the weekend, giving us the only bit of action in the sprint, then sacrificing Logan to make the race interesting as well. He will probably now be banned for a million years, but that was well worth it. I was ready to write a bit about how shit the action was in this one, and to be fair, if it wasn't for the yellows, this race would have been shit. But let's instead just say fair play to Lando Norris. That was a dominant drive in the second half of this one. Let me know what you thought of the race down below in the comments and in the poll over on my community page. While you're at it, if you enjoyed the comedy review, be sure to drop it a like and get subscribed for more in the future. A huge thank you to my members and patrons who get early access to some of this material. If you're interested in that, then you can head over to the links in the description down below. Now I'll be back with coverage on the IndyCar race next week, but until then, have a good one.